Three, values, counter values. A point of view I find strange is often defended in debates about equality between women and men. Since women do certain types of work, are associated with certain things, are quite simply this or that, have one kind of talent and not another, then, instead of trying to gain admission to traditional male roles, instead of breaking away from odd associations of ideas that bind us, of remaking ourselves or developing other talents, it is better to validate or revalidate our own activities, talents, and ways of being. As if women's value rose or fell according to what is associated with us, as if our worth could not simply be affirmed. Thus, to return to the example of intellectual faculties, we sometimes hear it said that if intuition or empathy, its modern equivalent, were given fair value, then women would, ipso facto, be revalued, and likewise housework, mothering, and so on. Such a project is vulnerable to all manner of critique. To begin with, the concept of intuition is unstable. It is impossible to claim that anything that might be called intuition exists in itself prior to any epistemological theory, no matter how imprecise. In your garden, you see hydrangeas, roses, and geraniums, as distinct and different from each other, and you think these distinctions among species exist prior to your awareness of them, and independently of it. It is not theory that produces the difference between a tulip and a hyssop plant. Only the catch-all category weed is an artifact that refers back to a merely functional connection. But bindweed will continue to be bindweed, and the ground elder will never be a dandelion, even if you do pull them all indiscriminately. By contrast, the constitution and distribution of modes of knowing does depend on the theoretical frame of reference you choose. You can have binary theories or theories comprising more than two terms. Intuition may or may not be part of the nomenclature. Sharp divisions, oppositions, or simply hierarchies may separate the various modes. As a result, the idea of reclaiming the value of intuition with the promise that we will revalidate women in so doing, has no fixed point. Its term of reference, intuition, to be reclaimed, does not function outside a general theory of the ordering of modes of knowledge. Moreover, the idea of recognizing the value of women by restoring respect for intuition is invalidated by the following counterexample. Schopenhauer, a contemporary of Hegel, assures us that, unlike Kant, I start from direct or intuitive knowledge. He finds a way to connect intuition and reason while subordinating reason to intuition, since intuitive knowledge, according to him, is more highly valued than conceptual knowing and discursive reason. Very well. Will he reach a conclusion favourable to our sex? Don't even dream of it. Reason is feminine in nature. It can only give after it has received. Of itself, it has nothing but the empty forms of its operation. There it is. Women lose on all counts. No matter what the philosophical framework, women are always on the wrong side. If intuition is devalued, it is said to be feminine. If reason is judged uninteresting, then suddenly it is reason that is deemed feminine. Whether it was Schopenhauer or Hegel whose stock was higher in the philosophical marketplace, the result was inevitably the same, and women were associated with deficient faculty. Yet another counterexample, Bergson wrote at a time when the expression feminine intuition was a fully-fledged lexical item. He foregrounds intuition. You might imagine that he draws first-rate conclusions about women's intellectual worth and that philosophically he rehabilitates the mode of cognition that is supposedly ours. Don't imagine anything. Read him. According to him, what is funny about the learned women in Moliere's play by the same name is that they translate scientific ideas into the language of feminine sensibility. Epicurus is charming. I dote on vortices. It is enough to rearrange the conventional signs just a little, now that intuition has regained its positive connotation, feminine intuition becomes feminine sensibility. And there you have it. 
everything remains in an order more fundamental than the arrangement of signs. Once again, a man has made a mockery of women, of characters created by a man, but purporting to represent real women whom you or I might meet, since feminine sensibility is a term applicable to both theatrical characters and living women. It may be noted in passing that the duality suggested in laughter between supposedly serious scientific ideas and ostensibly comic feminine sensibility may not correspond exactly to the structures of Bergson's philosophy of knowledge. If this duality has nothing to do with the epistemology Bergson attempted to advance, then we can be delighted by the example, since it forces us to conclude that a philosophical system imposes no constraints on anyone, not even its author, who can always find a way to say what he wants, no matter what he might have thought elsewhere. Questions with far distant origins. The British Parliament of 1653, if you can imagine such a thing, or the inability of philosophy to house intellectual faculties in the same brain, come back to haunt us in the form of vague ideas with forgotten origins, to which everyone nonetheless still subscribes. The identity imposed on us is made up of cast-offs. Could there be any greater insult? If we believe Hélène Monsacre, even our tears attest to a similar historical mechanism. In Homer's time, heroes wept. But then it became unacceptable for a warrior to cry, and so men, not knowing what to do with their tears, presented them to women. We are the little sisters who get the broken toys, the worn-out ideas, and the signs that are being discarded. However, the gift is snatched back when what appeared to be an ordinary stone is revealed as a diamond in the rough, or something that could pass for one. The practice of attributing these negative values to women is constant in form, even if the precise content varies ad libitum. Women can be taxed with anything at all, in a way that is both arbitrary and not accidental, provided that at some point in history it has had a negative value. This phenomenon did not escape the attention of Gabriel Souchon, who notes in 1693, when desires are seen as marks of need and poverty, they will be attributed by the score to women and girls, since people are always ready to turn unpleasant things over to them. She has discerned a kind of law, to which we may add a corollary underscoring the historic fluctuation of these gifts. In the 17th century, desire was in disrepute, and so women were said to have it in excess. Today, it has been revalued by psychoanalysis, which even sees it as a sign of mental health. Since then, it has become a male characteristic, even in the writings of female psychoanalysts. Thus, Helen Deutsch places woman at a pole of absolute non-desire. Whereas with animals, the sex drive of the male depends on female fertility rhythms, in the human species, the male could free himself from his dependence upon the feminine rhythm and take sexual possession of the female even without her consent. Among all living creatures, only man is capable of rape in the full meaning of this term. It is true that if one sex is constituted as the only subject of desire, and the other as the object of desire of the first, the configuration comes close to being an apologia for rape which, in contrast to animals, thus becomes the defining characteristic of man's human nature. Deutsch repeatedly insists that a woman in harmony with her nature has only intuitions. Thus we find this delectable passage. Woman's intellectuality is to a large extent paid for by the loss of valuable feminine qualities. It feeds on the sap of the affective life, and results in the impoverishment of this life, either as a whole or in specific emotional qualities. The intellectual woman is not Otonoe, the wise one, who draws her wisdom from the deep sources of intuition. For intuition is God's gift to the feminine woman. Everything relating to exploration and cognition, all the forms and kinds of human cultural aspiration that require a strictly objective approach, are, with few exceptions, the domain of the masculine intellect, of man's spiritual power, against which woman can rarely compete. All observations point to the fact that the intellectual woman is masculinized. In her, warm intuitive knowledge has yielded to cold, unproductive thinking. 
If there is a relationship between an apologia for rape and a condemnation of women's intellectuality in a work that addresses these two issues, then what exactly are we talking about when we discuss women's relationship to knowledge and the intuition that is said to be typically ours? Are we talking about the cognitive faculty that we think we understand, or about a general status of passivity to which women are confined? In any case, Deutsch confirms our idea of désirance, cast-offs. She goes on to affirm that the following passage from Goethe applies especially to intellectual woman. Believe me, a fellow who speculates is like a beast on an arid heath, led round in circles by an evil spirit, while close by a green meadow lies. According to Deutsch, the green meadow stands here for feminine affectivity and the arid heath for the speculating intellectuality to which woman is led by her masculinity complex. Isn't this wonderful? In typical German romantic fashion, Faust's self-criticism is aimed at the reasoner. For the poet, those who reason are dry, but nevertheless they are men. Deutsch doesn't hesitate to displace this characteristic on to women, and to write that the man who reasons too much is, in fact, an intellectual woman. We must analyse shifts of this sort with great care, no matter how much such analyses are blocked by the smokescreens of our age of which one notorious example is the question, is there a fundamental cognitive difference between women and men? If we want to investigate the position of women and men in the order of knowledge, it is vital to free ourselves from this question so that we can see phenomena of a different order of complexity and the hidden processes that accompany the construction of whatever is recognised as knowledge, as something worth learning.